Hello there. How are y'all doing? Especially those of you living in the United States, maybe around the world. I've had some events lately that have kind of been a shock to the system. Hopefully you're doing okay. Yeah, we thought about trying to get this episode out earlier, but we really wanted to take time and not act out of pure emotion. A lot of the responses to recent events have been coming straight from the fields, and that's important, and we need to do that and honor that. I wanted to come back with a plan. I wanted to come back and talk to you all about what happens now. What do we do with these messy feelings that we all have inside us right now? Because it's not just when an election goes a certain way. Sometimes we get bad news from our doctor, from our boss. There are times when life feels like it just betrays us. And we start asking ourselves, is hope a lie? Well, let's talk about that today as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello, everybody. My name is Charlie. I am a Christo pagan druid and a priest of Bridget. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian. I am a Christo pagan druid and sous chef to the Danta. And yeah, I think you can hear we're a little subdued, but we are doing okay. Want to get that out of the way? A lot of people very kindly contacted us and we're trying to find out how we were doing after the events here in the United States. And we're, we're doing okay. I felt that I was kind of warned by my sisters about this. They weren't specific enough that I was fully warned, but enough that when I started seeing the signs, I was like, oh, this is what y'all were talking about. Okay. Had a good talk with Bridget about it. I think we're going to be struggling, but most of us are going to be okay. They said it best when they said, you got to have a little fight in you. Yeah. Hope you got some fight in you, but it's going to be all right. Yeah. So before we get into all this, I just want to remind you, if you haven't already done it, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever it's called on the app that you're currently listening to us on. One, it helps us out a lot. And two, we do original Christo Pagan and Druid content five days a week on this podcast. And we've got a lot of very helpful topics lined up. You don't want to miss a thing. Don't forget to do that. I wanted to start by sharing a little anecdote or fun story kind of the morning after I get up, head out of the house and had a fun little meditational moment because the weather was actually almost what I would call perfect. It was 70 out, sunny, it was pleasant. There was a soft, gentle breeze that just occasionally happened on the air. The humidity was 80%, which I do not do well with humidity. That's why I said it was almost perfect. It was a wonderful kind of meditational moment on life is messy. Even when everything is almost where you want it, there's usually something that isn't there. Because if I could have dialed up the weather, the humidity would have been low as well. And I would have had some kind of bay breeze, but often life is an ideal. I think that this is kind of life. Yeah, I think this is something a lot of people misunderstand or have misrepresented to them about a life of faith and magic. I see this especially in atheists who very often, well, where was your God when? Where was your God when? All struggling right beside us because God is an energy that works within everybody where there's love, justice, beauty, there's God. Just because there's injustice, anybody working, fighting for justice, that, that's where God was. I think there's this misunderstanding that we will have the easy life. And this is one, one of the reasons why I can't let Christianity go. Like the reason I'm still a Christo pagan is Jesus was very clear. Like you're going to struggle. People are going to persecute you. People are going to say bad things about you. People are going to use you. You know, random acts of pain and misery are going to enter your life. Powers fall down. Illness strikes. There, there will be storms that will come. But to remember, how do you say it in the Sermon of the Mount? Look at the lily of the field. It does not sow, nor does it reap. God takes care of it. And I tell you, even Solomon and all of his riches was not adorned as beautifully as them. That's the thing for me too, that I really like and I take from that, is that so often we forget that we as people were put here to be stewards of the earth. We're given that free will. We as a collective group will make life as hard or as easy 
as we all collectively choose to make it. And part of life is accepting choices that others make that are mostly out of your control. Like you can't force them to choose. You can help educate your fellow people. You can help let them know, like when they're complaining about life being difficult, that we as a collective just need to choose better. Yeah. I, I think back to in the Old Testament when God's warning the Israelites to not switch from a judge's system. Do not go to kings. Yeah. But they still had that choice. They still got to switch to a system where they could have kings instead of judges. They suffered because of their choices. They suffered greatly. It wasn't God making them suffer. It was just collectively as people, choices that were made. And that's something that I like to keep in mind, especially at times like this, that it can be better. Giving up or checking out, giving into any of the instincts, the fight or the flight, giving into violence, giving into checking out, any of that is not the right choice. No. It is never the right choice because we have to keep both thoughts in mind that it is what it is. It was uncomfortably humid and the weather was beautiful at the same time. I just had to accept that and know that hopefully I can make better choices and, and help others. To... This is about helping others to make better choices. I think this is about community. Yes. I think it's definitely about community. When, when I look at what's going on in our country and around the world, the idea of community has gotten fractured. It's gotten broken. We've picked sides. It's something we've talked about on this podcast a lot with the, some of the infighting that's starting to happen among pagan and witchy communities over who's a real pagan, who's a real witch. This is something that's been happening within Christianity forever. Who's a real Christian? That sort of infighting is not helpful in any way, shape, or form. It's gotten worse because social media has allowed silos to form. If you didn't like the most recent Star Wars movies, there's a community out there telling you how awful everyone who made them was, everyone who likes them is. They're all evil. They're terrible. They're doing this on purpose to ruin your life because anger and fear make money. When I was studying marketing, one of the first things we were taught is modern marketing came into existence when they realized telling you our soap is good, it didn't work, but telling them you don't want to be embarrassed because you smell bad worked. Making people afraid of their natural body odor, making people afraid that their teeth are not going to be pristine white when that was never the case for humanity prior to a lot of the bleaching agents that we put into the toothpaste, that your clothes aren't fashionable enough. We, we created these drives through marketing and that has pervaded everything that we're not marketing hope or community or even quality anymore. We're marketing fear and fear is destructive. And that's kind of where we are today. People are afraid to talk to people who disagree with them. I understand that. I, you never know who's going to be hostile, violent, even you never know what those reactions are going to be, but that's why I, I wanted to bring us to the topic of hope. Hope is the most misunderstood, misappropriated word in the English language. Hope is not a feeling. Hope is not an emotion. Hope is not something that you rely on. Hope is a choice. Hope is something you do. This is why for most people, hope is a lie because they're not acting. I know if you've listened to our podcast for a while, you're maybe getting tired of me saying it, but faith without works is dead. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for and the essence of things not see. Hope is active. Hope is something you do. It's not something that you have. This is where we get it all twisted and wrong. I had hope in the election because I, who did everything I could in my power to achieve the goals I wanted. My hope did not fail me. The American people did. I've come to get used to that. I think when I was thinking about this, you know, why this didn't affect me the way it did a lot of my friends. I remember when rights were stripped away from me at the ballot. I remember when they passed laws against same-sex marriage. I remember how I felt when gender-affirming care was banned in my state. I remember how I felt being marginalized over and over and over again by the popular will of the voter. And I've kind of gotten used to that. That's a terrible thing. Like, I was madder that I wasn't as upset as a lot of my friends were because I had just come to accept 
well, I can work for Betterment, but, you know, people don't really care. And the thing is, that's true, and it's also a lie. People don't care about things that they don't know that they need to care about. People care about things that they don't understand. And this is where we get to what do we do going forward? Yes, the world betrayed us. You might feel like half of your country betrayed you if you're an American. If you're from outside the country, you may feel like our whole country has betrayed you. I watch RTE News because I like to get the, the view from outside the country. I am always fascinated with what's going on in Ireland. And the amount of concern, I don't think it rose fully to fear, but the amount of concern in their coverage of the situation on how this is going to affect the Irish economy and the Irish people if all of the things that were promised actually get done. So I, I get feeling betrayed. It happens. I'm saying this as somebody who remembers when they banned same-sex marriage in my state and who got married in this very same state because we overturned them. I say this as somebody who remembers them banning by popular vote in my state same-sex marriage and going to the courthouse and having them be excited. <gasps> we finally have somebody. They were so excited that they were handing out a marriage certificate to a same-sex couple. I remember both of these things. There is a future if you fight for it and if you work for it. And when I say fight for it, I don't mean physically. There are a lot of people out there who don't understand why Paul said we fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in high places. Because if you act violently, they have a justified reason to suppress you. If you're out there causing disorder and doing violence, you're going to lose any support you could have. You can actually see this in the early Christian movement. I'm sorry for anybody who doesn't understand early Christian history. Christians were violent people. They burned large portions of Alexandria. They were having riots all over the empire. The famous murder of, I really don't know how to pronounce her name. Nobody knows how to pronounce her name. Everybody disagrees on how to pronounce her name, but Hypatia, Hippatia, Hippolyta. Every, everybody pronounces her name differently. We don't know. But in Alexandria, and I, I don't think I can say on a lot of the platforms that were on what they did to her. Oh, yeah, it was terrible. In the name of God and Christ. If you're not familiar with Hippatia, look her up. Hippatia, whatever you would call her. And it worked against them. The great persecutions came in after this because, well, look, they're riotous mobs. The civil rights movement under Dr. K worked because they were able to show the contrast between these people earnestly desiring freedom and liberation in the face of state violence. People couldn't stomach seeing peaceful marchers being attacked by dogs and fire hoses and being beaten by the cops. That takes so much more strength. Everybody loves to misquote Nietzsche because apparently he's hard to read. I think of one particular person, but I am a big fan of a lot of Friedrich Nietzsche. He, in his writing, talks about two kinds of courage. There's the courage of the blood and the courage of the knife. The courage of the blood is the willingness to die for your principles, to stand up for them and accept whatever comes your way for standing up for them. The courage of the knife is the willingness to enact violence to get what you want. He says the second courage is a lie. The courage of the knife is a lie. It is the shield that cowards use to make themselves feel strong and powerful when they know in their hearts they are weak. He was right. Hope is an active choice. We didn't vote for this man because we wanted fascism. We can see the polls. We can see the results. They just wanted change. Change is what they wanted. And they had two choices the current vice president, and the guy who was president before. And while well, he's not in there now, they decided that he was changed. And a lot of people that voted didn't even know who was running. There was a spike in, has Joe Biden dropped out of the race on election day? When we talk about low information voters, I think we underestimate how low information a lot of these voters are. So no, hate didn't win. A hateful movement won, but hate itself did not win. I couldn't tell you the number of people I interacted with yesterday because we, we live in a very 
red state. There were a lot of people excited yesterday and all of their comments were not excited because of hate this or hate that. They were excited because change was going to happen. The economy was going to get better. Prices were going to come down. That's what they believed. That's what they voted for. And that's the thing to keep in mind. This is why when I talk about the things that we can do is when we have those personal conversations on an individual basis. First, it's remembering that you have mass groups and then you have the individual. The individual is not a mass group. Even if they're a part of a mass group, a lot of times they may be a part of it for other reasons. Groups are always stupid. Always remember, groups are always stupid. No matter how smart you are, you can get together with your 10 smartest friends, genius friends. I mean, cream of the crop, genius friends. You start working together as a group, your group decisions will be dumber than any of your individual decisions. It's a simple fact of group dynamics. Yes. And it's just something to keep in mind. And also with keeping in mind that there's personal choices, the things that affect them personally. I had close friends in the previous election that they didn't even vote, even though they were upset about what became from it because of the simple fact that the, at the time it was stuff that didn't affect them personally. They didn't care and they didn't see the connections. It was through personal conversations I was able to help them to see how what seemed like detached issues affected them personally on the stuff that they care about. So if we're going to choose hope, what are we going to hope for? We need to make this a we. You can have your own, add your own things to this, but we have some things we need to hope for collectively. And the first of those is better communities. That's it. It's easy to hate what you don't know. I've talked about this on other podcasts that I've been on, but gay rights succeeded to a large extent because of shows like Willie Grace. Because people who didn't know that they knew gay people had Will and Grace. Shows like Will and Grace help people feel comfortable to come out. And all of a sudden they realized they did know people. That changes a lot. If you know an undocumented immigrant, you probably know their story and how messed up our immigration system is. You probably have more empathy towards their struggle and are probably wanting to help from. Now, don't do anything dangerous. Don't do anything to put yourself in harm's way. This is what we need to be doing. We need to be reaching out. We need to be building those better communities. And we need to be phrasing and framing our goals and ideals in ways that people want to sign in, join up, be a part of it. Do I think a UBI would be the best thing for our country? Yes. If we're going to be moving in, into late stage capitalism and even beyond, because I do foresee, I, I'm not one of those people that believes that technology will be our penultimate savior. But I do think that we will get to a place where we have to admit that the scarcity economy doesn't exist. Because already we make enough food to feed everybody on Earth. We just don't. We choose not to do it. We're already entering a post-scarcity world. We just have moneyed interest <laughs> keeping us from living in that post-scarcity world. But that means we're going to have to radically change the economy. When talking about a UBI or talking about helping people with child care or doing good things for the schools and whatnot. What people hear is you want my taxes to be high. We have to stop thinking about how we're saying things and start really focusing on how we're being heard because we spend way too much time thinking about how we can structure the good argument, how we can say the right things, how we can hone and craft the perfect message. And then we're using words that are either going right over other people's heads or that they're hearing differently. Anytime I say the, the government should help people with the universal basic incomes or with health care, that we should have universal health care, or that we should have government subsidized ch child care for people who can't afford it, but still need to go out and work. All people hear is my taxes going up. How do we get past that? Because the other problem is if you say, well, we're just going to be taxing millionaires and billionaires. You have the other problem of, yeah, but one day I'll going to be a millionaire or a billionaire. And oh, sweetie. That's probably not true. We have to think about how we're being heard because we're not going to win the argument with facts and figures. And I know that hurts down in our souls because I'm one of those people that wants to make the rational argument. I want to make the, we're going to argue our way out of this. We're going to be able to show, look what's going on with climate change. Look at all the storms that actually affects people. Giving people numbers and facts and figures about climate change doesn't. 
because they're able to write that off and go, well, you made that those numbers up. Yeah, but you remember that hurricane and that hurricane and that superstore and that hurricane. The fact that we are having mid-continental cyclones now, a hurricane that spawns over land. You can't ignore that because that blew your shed down. You could have those conversations with people in ways that actually hit them because we have to talk to people's emotions. And that's what we on the left, on the progressive side of things, have forgotten. We really want to believe in this rational populist, but we are not rational beings. We are emotional beings, but we have to talk to the emotions. And that's where a lot of it's done on an individual basis. To share a personal story in the local area, over five, 10 years of personal conversations with individuals, but there was a huge shift in the area towards the gay community. The area used to be very much against it. They were other, all the negative things that are out there were labeled. That shifted because on an individual basis, I made it a personal story to each individual. So it became about who you love, who you love, right? Yeah, because everybody loves who they love. Love is something that is consistent across the board. Everybody has at least the feelings. Hopefully they get to experience it mutually returned, but they at least have for themselves those feelings. And nobody wants to have that violated. Nobody wants to be told you're not allowed to be in a consenting relationship with the other person when you both mutually love each other. And then the even more terrifying personal story that I brought up, like, oh, well, when your loved one was sick and you had to go to the hospital, remember they broke their arm or when they had that dancer or whatever it was, that was part of the personal story. Could you imagine if you went in and you were told you were not allowed to see them? You were not family and refused. And it suddenly struck at their very core. For some home that want to give in to that anger, do you want big government coming to tell you can't love who you love? A lot of it's just that personal bit, but it's it was emotional for them. And it did. It, the, the whole area, large groups of the area have shifted on that entire subject just from one individual and personal conversations and getting people to think about it in ways that it matters to them. Because a lot of them, they're not gay. They don't, they never had that experience. A lot of them didn't even have family members, so they didn't even have that story, but it was still, it became personal because then it was like, they still have wives, they still had husbands, they still had family members that they loved, children that they loved, and that they cared about. It also helps that we have the cheat code that we've been in a committed relationship since 1997, and I've been together since 96. Yeah. That broke a lot of their stereotypes of what a queer relationship looked like. And I'm not saying you have to have that, but that, yeah, when you can defy their stereotypes, I'm not saying that you have to have long relationships like we've had, but I'm just saying when you can defy the stereotypes, that also makes them go, wait, but I thought they were all, wait, we together how long? That goes a long way. I think, yeah, when you're working on hope, when you're planning what to hope for, you really want to break the issues down to their core, to their base level. Honestly, a lot of what went on, the systemic issue is sexism yeah, and misogyny. And it has been an ongoing issue for a long time. Yeah. And, and racism. And just the willingness to live with cognitive dissonance. Our state voted, majority vote, to enshrine a woman's right to choose we may have legalized gender affirming care in our state because the way the private medical decisions amendment was written, it technically includes us too. So we may have also enshrined trans rights into our constitution, but 52% of our state voted for that. And I think something like 60% voted for, for Trump. And a majority of them, it was still Trump versus Biden in their head because they couldn't get past the misogyny to even see a female yeah. in a leadership role. And a lot of it was on an unconscious level. They weren't even consciously aware that was what they were thinking, which is how they were able to have that cognitive dissonance in their own head because it kind of didn't exist exactly because they weren't fully aware consciously of what was going on in the choices they made. Remember, hope is a choice. Hope is a motivation. Hope is what gets you out of bed in the morning. Not because you feel it, but because you choose it. I choose every day to live and work for a kinder, more just, more, more equitable world for everyone. That's a choice. That's the choice we need to be making now. Hope didn't die with this election. Hope doesn't die when you get bad news from the doctor. Hope doesn't die 
when a sudden calamity strikes. Hope is a choice. You can stop choosing it, but I don't think that's the best course of action. The best thing for us to do, no matter what situation you find yourself in, is to actively choose hope and lay it out for yourself. What do you want to see? What is the world you want to see? What is that dream that you're working for? And strive for it every day. I hope this has helped you. I hope you don't feel like it came too late, but we wanted to process and have something valuable to say. Hopefully this was it. I would love to know your thoughts, what's going on in your head right now. Don't be, don't overshare anything. Don't feel pressured into that. But what might be really neat to see in the comments is what are you, what are you hoping for? Only positive answers. Cause I'm not hoping for little things. I'm hoping for big things because the one thing I know about having a narcissist in charge is if we can convince him that he would be beloved for doing certain good things, we might be able to trick him but for me. Like, he's a slim chance, but yeah. we gotta live in hope. But for me, I, I got up Monday hoping the world would be a little less misogynistic. I got up Tuesday hoping the world would be a little less misogynistic. And honestly, no matter who won, I was going to get up Wednesday hoping the world would be a little less misogynistic yeah. because no matter who won, that work was still going to have to be there. Yep. It was going to be there no matter what. And that hasn't changed. So let us know what you're hoping for. Positive answers only in the comments. If you're listening to us on YouTube or Spotify, you leave a comment right there and they will notify us and let us know. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if they say you can leave a comment, they don't notify us. So head over to creationsfast.com, click on chat and you leave a comment there and let us know what you think, what, you, what you're hopeful for as they will notify us so we will know while you're there. If you have a few dollars, you can pass our way. If you think about joining a membership, you can also support us on Patreon and Kofi. I am CE Dorsey on both. That money really does help us keep food on the table, keep the lights on, keep a roof over our heads. So thank you to everybody who does that. And as we're going our separate ways today, I want to say just a little prayer to the Blessed Mother. Oh, with sweet and holy Mary, never has it been known that anyone who flew to your patronage was ever turned away. We ask you who knew struggle and hardships, who had to flee from persecution, who was a refugee in Egypt, who struggled under an oppressive military occupation, and who watched them kill her firstborn son, and who through all of it kept and maintained the most blessed faith, that hope in a better world to come. Help us to have faith like you did through all of the struggles and trials of life that in the end, we may see that glorious kingdom that we long for come fruition. Amen. Amen.